Okay, well, good evening, everybody. I am going to uh, give you some background on uh, women in politics and where we are today. And I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen here. So I have a presentation. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of numbers and data, but I think it's probably the easiest way for me to um, go through all this, and then I'd be happy to take some questions at the end, and we can talk about all of this in a little bit more detail. But basically, what I'm um, what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through, give you some historical context, um, and talk to you about where we are today in terms of women's representation. First, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University. If you're not familiar with us, um, we actually just celebrated our 50th anniversary. Uh, it was founded in 1971, and when um, and when we were founded, we'd like to tell this story. The founders were told that women in politics was not a subject worth studying. There were only a handful of women serving in office. So what you know what is what is the point? What is there to research? Um, and you know it's interesting. We say they weren't just wrong in retrospect, but they were wrong at the time. Um, women started in the 70s. I mean, there have always been women engaged in politics, just in much smaller numbers. Um, but, you know, ever since we started counting in the 70s, we started counting all the numbers of women serving in elected office in the U.S., um, women have been on a steady upward trajectory in terms of their representation. Today, uh, our, our center, which we call COP, um, in shorthand, is nationally recognized as the leading source of the data and the research on women's political participation in the U.S. Um, we have a timeline on our website, um, and so we encourage you to go there. I will drop a link in the chat at some point. But basically, just to be clear, even though we study politics, we're nonpartisan. We're a bridge between the academic and the political world. So we have scholars that study the issue, but we also engage in, um, in everyday life. Um, we really wanna make the research on women's participation accessible and usable uh, in a practical sense. So we help program planners think about how can we engage more women into poli in politics and government. Um, and so we run public leadership and campaign training programs for women of all ages. Again, completely nonpartisan. We're not issue based. We don't do anything with that. It's very much the nuts and bolts of how you want to get engaged in politics. Um, and we have, you know, just a treasure trove on our website of data, current and historical information and data about women as candidates, public officials, and voters. Um, and so again, as I said, I'm going to really focus on women as office holders and voters to give you a, um, a sense of where things have been and where they're going. Um, this is a, a, a slide. I think Daryl might have seen it before when I did this presentation as a popular one um, that I like to use. We like to use in presentations. This is basically, you know, from way back when, when the women's suffrage movement um, was was really taking taking shape um, and you know, it really, this cartoon really speaks to the concern that um, people had, or, you know, men in particular had about women's suffrage, is this idea, and if you can't see the caption, it says, um, suffrage, feminist, ideal family life. Um, you know, the, the male hen says, but why ma, these eggs will get all cold, and she, the suffragist, says, sit on them yourself, old man, my country calls me. And so this was the concern, the prevailing concern is that women, if they were given the right to vote, would just leave the household and, you know, not stay home and take care of the kids and all that kind of stuff. Um, those were the sort of fears that they had about women, um, you know, winning the right to vote. Um, so they did. So. So this is a lot of what they had to do. I just want to, you know, and you all may already know this, but a lot of what they had to do. A lot of those fears had to do with the household and um, women, you know, sort of the traditional family roles being upended. But they also were really concerned that women might do things like establish prohibition and do other like undesirable um, policy changes. Um, and so, so that was a big concern. But as we know, women got the right to vote in 1920 and the 19th Amendment was passed. Um, but what was interesting is that when women began to vote, they did not turn out in huge numbers, and they did not initially differ significantly from men in terms of like the, how the votes um, went. 
Um, so it wasn't, you know, they just didn't turn out in massive numbers at the time. It was not a big deal um, in 1920 and, and going from 1920 to, to beyond. But if you sort of jump ahead to the second half of the 20th century, voting patterns really did change. Starting in this chart starts in 1980 for a reason. We have charts that show before 1980, but basically from 1920 to 1980, the proportion was flipped. And so you could see, see the darker color here is women. In 1980, women started voting at higher rates than men did in presidential election years. And you can see that trend continued ever since then. Um, the, more women have voted than men um, in presidential election years. This, and, and then, so it's continued to this day. Women um, outvote men. Um, so even though the fears took maybe 60 years to you know, materialize, it, it, it's still it, it's something that hasn't changed at all. And there's not, um, there's, not, um, there's not sort of any other way to talk about it except to say that yes, women absolutely outvote men. Um, with that graph, and this is basically, what that graph basically shows you is that the number of female voters exceeded the exceeded the, na the number of male voters in every presidential election since 1964. In all presidential elections prior to 1980, the voter turnout rate for women was lower than the rate for men. In every presidential election wow. since 1980, the voter turnout rate for women has been higher than the rate for men. Um, so it's, you know, as I said, it's fair to say that the, the hopes of the suffragists and the fears of their opponents actually have in fact been realized. Women do, in fact, vote in larger numbers than men. In some cases, they vote distinctively on their issue areas. However, I will say, while women have made strides as voters in terms of numbers, um, and they have made significant strides in office holding since we began counting in the 1970s, they're still dramatically underrepresented. Um, for some historical context, since 1789, only about 3% of all members of the US Congress have been women. Um, that's basically the entire total since 1789, only 366 women have ever served in US Congress. Um, and so, so to keep that, that number in your head, 366 out of 12,348 men who have served in US Congress to date. Um, so again, 3%. So, the rise in women serving um, in office and in Congress in particular has been impressive in our nation's history. It's still a tiny slice um, of congressional representation has been female. And so um, you know, I'd like to point that out. Um, and much of the progress that we've made has been in the last 20 or 30 years. So if you sort of think about 1789 to now, um, most of the progress, and I'll get into the numbers with you in more detail. Um, this is um, this is chart of women serving in U.S. Congress. Um, again, we started in 1961 with this particular. There obviously have been there were a handful of women who served who served in Congress prior to 1961, um, but we really started counting. I mean, we started counting in the 70s, and this is when the meaningful number of women so we got to double digits. Um, Twenty women were serving in the U.S. Congress in 1961. And you can sort of see this chart, the gray line is the total, it goes up to 150 are serving in Congress today. Um, and so again, if you think about that 366, this 366 in total since 1789 includes the 150 women who are serving today. Um, so you can see how, how slow the progress is. And we raise this a lot because um, people say, well, there are a lot of women serving in Congress now, you know, and it's not an issue. You get a lot of marquee names that you hear a lot about, like Nancy Pelosi, who was the Speaker of the House, and, you know, things like that. But um, that sort of doesn't quite paint the picture that it took a really long time to get even, and we're still not near parity. The other thing I just want to quickly point out um, is the partisan split. You can see the Democratic women, and I'll get, I'll get more into that, but Democratic women uh, far outpaced Republican women um, and have, and there was a, there was a brief period there where they were sort of evenly matched, um, but then it, it sort of split from there. 
Um, current situation, women hold 150, which is 28% of the 535 seats in the U.S. Congress. Um, 25 of them are in the Senate and 125 of them are in the House. And as I just pointed out, there's a big partisan disparity. 107 of the women serving in U.S. Congress are Democrats and 42 are Republicans. One is an independent. Um, moving on then to statewide office, we have a record 12 women serving as governors in 2023. It is a record. Um, it, you know, it's not a particularly impressive record when you think about 12 out of 50. Um, but um, the, the next number down that was a record was nine. Um, so it went from, you know, the record was nine for a really long time. And then it, you know, it jumped to 12. This just this year. Um, and for the historical piece of it, 49 women have ever served as governors in 32 states. And as I just said, we achieved the record in 2023. In 2023, also 94 women hold statewide elected executive positions. So that includes governor, but also lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and so on. And that that encompasses basically 30% of those positions. In New Jersey, we only have two statewide positions, the governor and the lieutenant governor. But in many other states, they have um, you know, considerably more or, mo or most of their sort of secretary of state and treasurer, and those types of positions are actually elected. So there's more opportunity um, in other states. When we talk about uh, moving on to state legislatures, you can sort of see the rise. I put this, I put the candidates in here so you can see the trends. Um, these are the numbers of women nominees um, for the state legislative seats over the last um, two decades. And you sort of see, Kind of what happens this chart sort of shows you what I, the reason I want I put this chart in here is to show you what's been going on for the last few years in particular the last few election cycles um you can sort of see in 1992 it had been from the 70s to the 90s there had been this sort of steady rise in women serving in state legislatures running for and serving in state legislatures but around 1992 it pretty much plateaued um just around 25 percent of um of all state legislators were women and it stayed there you, you know kind of you can't see me doing this but I'm like following the chart and you see that gray line it just is pretty flat um and it you know maybe a little bump a little bump you know you get into like 2012 2014 slightly better but still nothing crazy in 2018 is where we saw a huge number of women running for office and state legislative seats in particular. And it was mostly on the Democratic side that all the energy was. Um, and you can all think about what happened in the presidential election in 2016 and then in 2018. Democratic women were particularly motivated um, to run for office. So we saw a huge increase uh, in the number of women running. Um, and so that's where we saw the big jump. And it was the first time we had seen any meaningful, like sort of moving of the needle in a really long time. Um, and then in 2020, those gains sort of held steady, although we saw more Republican women running and, um, and they improved upon their numbers just slightly. And then the same again here in 2022. So, you know, the good news is that we're continuing to trend upward. It's just not, we're not seeing as big a jump. Um, then if I move on to where we are starting um, today with the elected, state legislators right now. Um, and I actually forgot to change the, to say in 2023, um, 2,414 of the 7,383 state legislators in the United States are women. So that's 33%. So we had been, you know, going from about 25% to now we're at 33%, just a third. Um, and, but you know, it's, which is very good, but no, we're close to parity and that's overall. Um, and then we have the breakdown by state Senate and state house. And I also want to tell you all this information is available on our website. So you can look up where we are at any time, um, what the current numbers are. Um, but I also want to point out to you, I put the top 10 and bottom 10 states and you can get all the states on our website, but you can really see the disparity. Um, Nevada actually became the first majority woman um, state legislature in, in U.S. history in, 20, in 2019, after the 2018 election. Um, they had 50, after, after that election in um, 2018, they had 51% of their legislature was female. And then they improved upon that um, 
in the last couple of election cycles. So now they're at 60% of their legislature is female. And then you can see like Colorado's just right there, second state to achieve parity in representation. And, and the other states are pretty, the other top 10 states are relatively close by, you know, close behind them. Um, but the bottom 10 states, I mean, West Virginia is 12% of their legislature is female. So it's a huge difference. Um, and it really speaks to the idea that interventions need to be state-based in a big, big way. Um, you know, we could talk about the numbers nationally, but representation varies dramatically across the states. And then the party story continues to be the same at state legislatures as it is, as it is in Congress. Um, you know, Democratic women far outpace Republican women in terms of running for and serving in state legislatures. There have been some improvements in recent years, but if we're ever going to get to parity, we need to see, um, you know, more representation on both sides. Like we need Republican, more Republican women to run um, and more support from the Republican party for those women. Um, I will say that uh, in response to that, uh, that trend that was sort of disturbing, in fact, in, after the 2018 election, we lost Republican women in US Congress, like numbers went down. And there were a number of Republican women who were really concerned about that. So they've started a lot of programs and things like that. And, and there have been um, a number of programs on the Democratic side as well, but uh, traditionally had been fewer on the Republican side, but there have been a renewed, there has been a renewed push nationally um, by Republican women to get more. So that's a trend that we're seeing um, that is a little bit different and a little bit newer. And then women state legislators by race and ethnicity. There's been a lot of progress in increasing women's representation, but this chart basically shows you that there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, this is the breakdown of state legis women state legislators by race and ethnicity. This is as of 2022. We don't have the 23 numbers yet, but we will hopefully very soon because we rely on self-identification. So we're in the middle of surveying all the newly elected state legislators um, to get this information. But, you know, it's very, it probably will be somewhat, hopefully there'll be some improvements, but there's still a long way to go in terms of, um, you know, making sure that the representation reflects the population. And then New Jersey government. We have two women in our 14 member congressional delegation. Uh, we've only elected one woman as governor in history. Two women have served as lieutenant governor since the position was created. And I actually realized I put, um, I have another typo. I put one Democratic woman is actually a Republican woman. Christy Todd Whitman was our governor. Um, current situation, Phil Murphy has 15 women in his cabinet representing 60% of his 25 member cabinet. He's the first governor in New Jersey history to have a majority female cabinet. Um, women, 42 women serve in the New Jersey legislature. They hold 35% of the 120 available seats. And so, as I just told you, nationally, women hold 33%. So New Jersey is actually doing better than the national average. We rank 21st among the 50 states. I will tell you there was a brief moment of glory. We ranked 10th in the nations about, I think, 2007, 2008 um, or so, somewhere around there. We did actually rise and we ranked 10th in the nation. We haven't gotten worse in terms of the numbers. We've continued to improve, but other states have improved faster. So that's why we're now at 21st. But I'm hoping that we continue to rise. Um, uh, New Jersey has one of the most diverse legislatures in the country in terms of women's representation. Women of color make up 55% of all the women in our legislature. At the county level, women hold just under 40% of county commissioner seats, which is a record um, in 2023. At the local level, just under a third of all council members are women. The one challenge we have is 17% of mayors are women, and we've been stuck at 17% or somewhere around there for, for as long as I can remember. So we have more work to do in terms of um, women have sort of steadily improved in terms of running for council seats, but um, we have more work to do in terms of um, having women in those executive mayor positions. And we have a county report card on our website, which every year we rank all the counties in terms of women's representation and county seats and in municipal seats and mayor seats. 
Some counties do better for women's representation. Union County is currently leading the pack. Um, if you check out our county report card from last year and Salem County is in last place. Um, so. so why should we care? This is the number, this is the question that we get repeatedly. It's like, why should we care whether we elect women? Um, you know, there's the, the obvious democratic uh, sort of governance answer, which is that government should be reflective of the population. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that in every way, not just by gender, but by race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and background and um, all of that. We just want to make sure that government has all the different voices of the population. And, and if you, when it comes to the applicant pool, as we jokingly call it, you know, you want to hire the best for the job. You want your applicant pool to be as wide as it possibly can be. And when there's whole segments of the population that are not necessarily um, involved, then you're missing, you know, some of your best applicants. We also talk about role models and symbolic representation. Um, you know, we, we talk about this often. We have a project called Teach a Girl to Lead, which is uh, a program for elementary school kids we really want to teach them to have a different to have a different idea of what um, what a public figure looks like and acts like. And so we want girls and boys to grow up thinking, you know, that women could be the mayor of their town um, or their member of Congress and not have um, sort of an, an expectation uh, of what a public figure should be, which has been traditionally older and male. Um, and so we talk about that a lot. You know, it's really important to have different types of people in public office so that younger generations can say, you know, no matter who they are, whatever their background is, they can say, I see this person. This person reminds me of me. I could be, I could be a public leader too. I could be, I could run for mayor of my town um, or serve on my town council and so on. And then, you know, the bottom line from our point of view is that elected women make a difference and our research shows that. Um, our research our research and the research of some other political scientists have shown that women make a difference in a number of different ways. Um, women change the policy agenda. They raise and promote different issues, particularly concerns of women, children, and families. Women, when it comes to procedure, women change the way govern, government works. There, um, and this, this, is, this is based on surveys of state le male and female state legislators, um, where they both have acknowledged this to be the case, um, that women are more receptive to openness in government and tend to be more inclusive. They tend to bring in voices that have struggled to be heard in the past. Um, they tend to be more transparent and look at legislation differently, adding new elements and ideas to the discussion. Um, the surveys also showed women, women and, and men legislators believe women are more likely to build alliances, um, including with women's organizations, as well as with others outside of government who have been disadvantaged in American society. Um, and so then as a result of all of these things, women's presence can change the outcomes of legislative work. So it's important to have their voices at the table. This is also one of my favorite um, cartoons to show. Um, this is a good example of why diverse institutions are important because choices that are made ripple out. And, you know, it took women decades and decades to get uh, the right to vote or more than decades, right? Um, more than a century to, to win the right to vote. And we know that that's a challenge. Um, and that's just one example but this is what happens when people are not at policy making tables. They miss the opportunity to have their voices heard and, um, and to have their rights acknowledged and so on. Continuing on um, with some of, the, some of the research findings, um, when we surveyed, these are some of the views the kind of, as I said, we surveyed male and female state legislators, and here are some of what their views showed. And this, you can see, um, there is some difference in terms of um, what men believe. And I think, you know, my chart is a little too tiny there, but the blue is women and, um, and the orange is men. 
But you can see women overwhelmingly, women state legislators believe they have special re responsibility to represent women's concerns. Um, the majority of men um, said that too, but obviously to a lesser degree. <clears throat> a fairly similar number uh, or proportion believed that um, women affect the extent, women legislators affect the extent to which legislators, the presence of women legislators affect the, ex the extent to which legislators consider how bills affect women. So having them in the room as part of those discussions really does make a difference. Um, and then, you know, the overwhelming majority of both male and female legislators believe that um, that uh, having women legislators there affected the number of bills that passed that dealt specifically with women and women's issues. These are very, very, you know, those are, those are very important things, self-reported state legislators saying that. So. Um, I wanted to give you a few examples of in, you know, how things are in New Jersey that may make some of it be more real to you. Um, these are some of the things that women legislators in New Jersey have advocated for, some of the bills and legislation that they have been, um, whoops, I think I'm back, um, that they that they have really advocated for. Um, legislation like requiring insurance companies to allow for two nights in the hospital for new mothers. I mean, that was uh, the brainchild of a woman state legislator um, who was tired of these sort of drive-by, you know, like within 24 hours, you had to be out of the hospital because right. insur your insurance company wouldn't pay for more than that. Um, and so now insurance companies are required to pay for at least two nights in the hospital. Um, paid family leave, anti-bullying laws, and um, efforts to save funding for family planning. Um, in the case of the anti-bullying legislation that came out of New Jersey, which is considered a model for the nation, of the eight assembly sponsors, five were women, three Democrats, and two Republicans. Um, so one thing we do know is that on certain issues, women legislators are more likely to work across the aisle. And we have any number of examples of that. But it's really important to think about, especially now in the, the hyper-partisanship and polarization um, in politics, it's getting harder and harder to work across the aisle. Um, there is the potential for this. Um, it's not, you know, it's not guaranteed, but it is something that research has borne out in the past that women legislators are more likely to be consensus builders. So, so where does that leave us? Um, this is another cartoon that we really like. Um, you know, we can't, this comes up a lot because um, this idea of, you know, there were a record number of women who ran for the presidency in 2016. Um, and a lot of people will say to us, well, I mean, I can, you know, does gender matter? I, I'm not going to vote for somebody just because of gender. Um, and we would never expect anyone to. Um, what we do say to people is we encourage you to find women candidates that you do like and admire and or women that you think should be public leaders and um, and encourage and support them to run for office, um, regardless of, you know, like if it's if it's the only people in your party, of course, that's what you should do. But we need to think about more broadly about widening the the sort of pool of people who are running for office so that we can keep the momentum going. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up with some key takeaways in the current situation. I said in 2023, as I said, women office holders have broken records for U.S. Congress, governors, and state legislative seats nationally. Um, women did make gains in representation this last election cycle in 2022, but those gains were more modest than they were in 2018 and 2020. They were also less unbalanced across party lines. So we saw, like I, I talked about, the Democratic Party in 2018, and then the Republican Party did better in 2020. Um, but in 2022, there was less of that. It seemed like more evenly matched on both sides. Um, there's been a ton of attention on women voters, and that only has a positive effect because it may help shape party platforms and recruitment initiatives um, going forward. And then, as I just mentioned, a record number of women ran for the presidency in 2020, and some women are already starting to throw their hat in the ring for 2024. On the Republican side, Nikki Haley announced her candidacy, and um, on the Democratic side, Marianne Williamson is announced her candidacy as well. 
Um, I suspect, obviously, because, well, we don't know what's going to happen on the Democratic side, but assuming the incumbent president runs again, we'll really see um, if we see more women candidates or a lot more women candidates running for president, it will really be on the Republican side here. And then these are the themes that we're actually watching for going forward. You know, we've had this tremendous rise. I, mean, I wouldn't say tremendous, actually, but we've had a pretty good rise, um, you know, in women running and serving in office in very recent years. But our concern has been, I think I was just saying this to Daryl, um, before we got on the call or before we got on this on this um, talk publicly, which is what what's going to happen with women going forward? There's been a lot of, in general, and actually I should say in general and politics going forward, there's been a you know a lot of attention on politics in the last several years, but people do do seem to have a little bit of burnout. Um, this idea about of getting engaged and staying engaged feels harder. The pandemic was very hard for a lot of people. There are financial concerns uh, for a lot of people right now. So what's going to happen? I mean, we in 2022 the numbers, the overall number of women candidates continue to go up, but only slightly. And we need the you know the trends to continue to be going faster. What partisan trends will we see in 2024? Will Republican women be motivated? Will Democratic women be motivated? Um, those are the kinds of things we think about. Will they continue to move closer to gender parity within candidate pools? Because one thing I didn't mention earlier, I don't think, is that even though we've seen record numbers of women running for office, there's still a pretty small portion of their party's overall candidates. So Democratic women, for example, in 2018, broke records for Democratic women running for office, but they were still like a third of the overall Democratic candidates. Um, it's only when they get closer, candidacies get closer to parity, will we even see a significant jump in um, office holders. What will the racial and ethnic diversity among uh, women candidates look like in 2024? What other milestones might we see? Um, you know, like as I mentioned, 2020, there was a record number of women running for president. I don't know that we're going to see that again, but um, maybe we will. Um, what other things will we see? What will be some of the will be some of the big moments? Um, redistricting is something that comes up. Um, it was a bigger deal in 2022, but is it going to continue to affect anything going forward and beyond? And that's something to think about. Um, every 10 years this this comes up and and we sort of end this book will women win you know um we do know when women run they win at the same rates as male candidates but um but they're less likely to run but will we see any sort of big gains in 24 will it continue to will it now flatline hopefully we won't lose any ground what's going to happen and then we also get the question of what what can i do how can i help keep the momentum going. Um, and so, you know, we always say you should ask a woman to run for office and any office. I mean, if it's, if, it's, if you're concerned about issues in your town or you just want to see more leadership or more diverse leadership in your town or whether it's you want to see more, you know, women in Congress or whatever it is, you should ask a woman to run for office. We do know also that women are far less likely to get asked to run for office than their male counterparts, either by party leaders, other elected officials, community leaders, et cetera. Um, the research has shown they're much much less likely to get asked. So if we're all doing the asking and the encouraging, it makes a difference. Um, you can support women who are running for office. Um, you could run for office yourself or seek an appointment. And we have um, resources for you at our website. So that's the very quick overview of where we're at.